Hey everybody, and welcome to what is now our second video here on the Respiratory Cares uh, YouTube channel discussing some interesting research. And today is exciting because we actually have the author of the paper to uh, discuss um, the findings of the paper. So my name is Brady Scott. I am a respiratory therapist and an associate professor at Rush University in Chicago. And I'm joined with my colleague, Dr. Jay Lee, who's also an associate professor and respiratory therapist at Rush University in Chicago. Uh, again, happy to introduce uh, Dr. Oriel Roca. Or Dr. Roca, can you tell us um, where you're located and your position there at your facility? Yes, I'm, my name is Oriel Roca. I work in Bailebron University Hospital. I'm the medical coordinator of the intensive care unit. Uh, and I'm an intensivist located in Barcelona. Great. To be thank here. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, it is, uh, we're several hours apart, but I think it's daylight currently for the both, both of us at the time that we're recording this. And so just for everybody to know, here's the paper we're going to talk about. So Dr. Roca has a paper that is currently at the, at the time of this recording is still um, uh, published ahead of print. And I'm going to show you on the website which one that we're actually talking about. So this paper that you see is driving pressure is a risk factor for ARDS in mechanically ventilated subjects without ARDS. And this is set to publish in the October edition of Respiratory Care. But before we go any further, I would I, I want to mention um, an important paper that was published by Dr. Roca in Respiratory Care. I happened to be perusing the website and I went to the most cited list and uh, I click on the most cited paper here at the top, high flow uh, oxygen therapy in acute respiratory failure. And that's also was a paper published by Dr. Roca back in 2010. And when we were getting ready for today's call, I told him that I went to Google Scholar and found out this paper has been cited over 500 times. So quite an important paper when we were learning more about high flow. So congratulations on that. Go ahead, Dr. Lee. And I also want to point out Dr. Roca is the first one to propose ROCKS index, the famous ROCKS index. That's and correct. I <laughs> so again, it's it's really our honor to have you here and to have you speaking with the, the listeners of the Respiratory Care's YouTube channel. So Dr. Roca, I want to get started uh, about this paper. And I just really want to start by asking what prompted you to conduct the study? And in, in, the, in the second part of that is, if you don't mind, uh, can you help the, the listener or the viewer uh, better understand the significance of driving pressure? Well, um, I have to say that this is a postdoc analysis of a large international observational study that is conducted every four years by the group of uh, Andres Esteban, Oscar Penuelas, and Fernando Frutos in Getafe in Madrid. And they, which is called the Ventila study. And they um, make a whole picture about how uh, our critically ill patients are ventilated. They started, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, late 90s or beginning of uh, 2000. Uh, and they have repeated several times. This, is, this was the fourth edition. They, they publish in ICM the results of the comparison between the four studies. And we decided after that to perform this study because there is a rational, a strong rational about the implications of driving pressure in ARDS patients, but the rational in, in, in non-ARDS patients is a little bit lower, mainly based on uh, post analysis of large uh, or no so large randomized control trials. So, we wanted to assess if the effect of driving pressure, which could be considered as the functional size of the lung, uh, could be of interest also in non-ARDS patients in terms of predicting or identifying those patients who are more likely to develop ARDS when they do not have ARDS at the time of intubation. So again, um, I can, can you help us understand what is known? What, again, before, before this paper, I think the big difference here is, I think that like myself, when I've read about driving pressure, it's this concept of the functional uh, size of the lung, the baby lung concept, if you will. And, uh, but what was known before this about the, specifically, if you know, uh, about the driving pressure in non 
ARDS patients? We had only um, studies that include a small number of patients or were uh, or had some selection bias as they were post-op analysis of randomized control trials with a strict exclusion and inclusion criteria for the patients to be included. So the effect of driving pressure in non-injured lung at the time of intubation was not so clear. Uh, and because the size of the lung is larger compared to those who, uh, who had ARDS, uh, maybe one, one could hypothesize that, that, that the, the effect of driving pressure could not be so important in those patients. And, and we observe that it's equally important and maybe the levels of diving pressure that we are able to tolerate would be even lower than the ones that had been previously described within ARDS. That's so important because I think that, you know, we, we go to conferences, we talk about how to treat the ARDS patient, how to, you know, we're tech, COVID ARDS and even now nowadays in, with COVID ARDS, but maybe we don't talk enough about how to treat the non-ARDS patient, which in reality is the one we see the most, right? We, we don't see ARDS as much as we see non-ARDS. So perhaps I think, so I applaud you for taking a look. Let's, how can we get better at those without ARDS, right? So Dr. Lee, you had a couple of questions for, uh, yes. for Dr. Roca. Actually, yeah. So when you talk about those non-ARDS, you know, mechanical ventilation strategy for those non-ARDS patients, I do have in an uh, interesting question is, in as we all know, in fertile study, they all found the lung protective ventilation strategy was associated with the patient outcome in those non-ARDS patients. But in this study, we saw the average tidal volume was set at 8 mL per kg instead of 6. So do you have any, you know, comments on the description of this, you know, uh, difference? Yeah, I, I think that this is an observational study and this is real life. This is what we do every day in our patients. Uh, um, and this is an international study where uh, participated a huge number of I, different ICUs worldwide. So um, if you look at the Langsaid study, which is the maybe the, the biggest uh, large or the largest observational study performing ARDS patients, you see exactly the same. One thing in randomized controlled trials where everybody sets the tidal volume at six, and then you come to the real life and you go to the LangSafe or our study and you see the tidal volume is set at 7.6 or 7.8 ml per uh, uh, predicted body weight. So this is not different from what we know previously. And, and this is a common finding that it's constantly repeated in observational studies. So uh, due to this, we all, so we also know in your study, we found out the high driving pressure well, was associated the, with the development of ARDS. Does that mean in clinical practice, if you use 8 ml per kg and you find your patient has a very high driving pressure, you should reduce the tidal volume? This is what, uh, you could do, but of course our results are purely observational and now the next step would be to test it in a randomized controlled trial comparing two different strategies. One setting tidal volume according to driving pressure, another setting tidal volume at the fixed value of tidal volume, for instance, which is what most people do, setting at six or at eight or uh, the tidal volume that, that you believe is the one that you have to use in this particular patient. Of course, of setting tidal volume according to the level of diving pressure that you are generating when this tidal volume is, in, is entering to the lung is a, a, some kind of personalization of tidal volume settings. So I would suggest to use it, but it based only, I insist on observational data. And these data need to be tested in our randomized control trial. Definitely, so that's an interesting part for do a randomized control trial to test this hypothesis. Brady. Yeah. No, I was just saying, so, you know, what I'm hearing you say is, uh, you know, this is a tremendously important study to help us really plan for more future for further studies to evaluate this and see 
how to actually implement this or use this information at the bedside. Because I think that what Dr. Lee, at least Dr. Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, but what kind of, what, what do we do with this information, right? So how do, if I go to the bedside and I have a patient with a high driving pressure, what do I do now based on this? So am I correct, Dr. Roken, saying that, well, right now, um, not 100% sure we need to study that. Uh, we need further information and, and perhaps those are the plans in the future. Yeah, this sure is one of the uh, possible steps for the near future. I, I wanted to comment also that uh, the level of driving pressure that you get is also influenced by the level of PIP that you, that you are using. Correct. And, and not only tidal volume, you can decrease uh, driving pressure, um, decreasing tidal volume, but uh, also setting the appropriate PIP and assessing the recruitability of the patient, which is more important in ARDS patients and not so important in non-ARDS. But uh, setting the right PIP is also important to decrease as much as you can the airway pressure that you get. Dr. Roca, is this complicated by uh, a whether or not a patient is breathing spontaneously versus uh, somebody who might be sedated or paralyzed? It seems like uh, even I think this was in the discussion part of the paper. I, I don't have it uh, up in front of me now, but the discussion part of the paper was that you know if, if a patient who is breathing spontaneously, this might this information may be a little more difficult to ascertain. Yeah, this is a little bit more difficult to interpret. It can be estimated as well. It was okay. not estimated in our study, but the group of Giacomo Villani, which is uh, uh, the, probably the, the the group that. Uh, uh, has been uh, pushing a lot in um, measuring driving pressure in a spontaneously, spontaneously breathing patient is, is uh, doing a lot of work on this uh, issue. And it's now currently performing a big study that probably uh, will uh, provide us much more information about the value, the prognostic value of, of driving pressure in uh, a spontaneously breathing patients. That's fantastic. Jay Lee, any other questions? So I have not asked the question is what's a, a limitation in this study? Well, there were a lot, but mainly the, the main limitation is, is that it's purely observational uh, and, and uh, obviously the data that we have need to be tested then in a, in a randomized control trial as we, as we commented before. And the other main limitation related with the methods uh, is that we uh, measure uh, driving pressure once a day. And there, is, there might be some intra-daily variability of uh, the value of the driving pressure that we could not uh, uh, really assess with, with the methods that we follow. But, but this is also, again, real life. You are not always at the bedside and you measure once, twice, or uh, three times a day diving pressure and then you set accordingly the ventilator in, in, your, in your daily practice. So it's, it's what we routinely do uh, when we are uh, at the bedside, we measure and then we take position according what, on, on what we have measured. Well, all right. Well, I think this is an excellent discussion and I encourage anybody uh, who is listening today to go read this paper. Uh, there is some really interesting statistical analysis with uh, the bootstrap method. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of folks enrolled in the study, and I find this to be tremendously important. And Dr. Roca, I will say uh, thank you for uh, doing this work at, that will drive further research that will help us, you know, in the future, know how to better care for those patients without ARDS, which again, like I said, is the majority of the patients that we are caring for. So with that, I thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, any last words from you? No, thank you very much, Dr. Roca. Thank you okay. very much for the invitation. Okay, thank thanks, Dr. Roca. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. See you later.